Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine. And uh, we're, we're very pleased to be hosting uh, this evening Jeffrey Stern, who's here to talk about his new book, uh, The Mercenary, a story of brotherhood and terror in the Afghanistan war. Uh, now, uh, it was about a, a decade and a, and a half ago, uh, shortly after graduating from college, that, that Jeff went to Afghanistan uh, with no job lined up or, or even much of a prospect of one uh, at that time, but with an abiding desire to somehow make it uh, as a journalist. And he connected uh, after he landed with a driver in Kabul named uh, Amal, uh, who had ambitions of his own. Uh, the mercenary recounts how these two young men first managed their way around the, the dangers and opportunities of, Af of Afghanistan back then, and, and how their lives have continued to intersect in, in the years since. Uh, Jeff went on eventually to, to work a, as a journalist, writing magazine stories, pursuing investigative pieces, and doing adventure reporting on wars and, and outbreaks from Iraq to West Africa. Amal's life uh, took a, a, a quite a different and more disrupted and uh, at times troubled course, marked by arms dealing during the US military presence in his country and then uh, an escape to, to Canada. Um, this, this isn't the first time Jeff has drawn on his Afghan experiences to, to write a book. Uh, his first work, his first work, the lost, the, the last thousand, uh, published uh, about seven years ago, uh, told the story of a private school in Kabul that flourished uh, under the U.S. military presence, and then uh, wrestled with the consequences as that protection disappeared. Uh, he's also co-authored the 1517 to Paris, about how three Americans helped divert a terrorist attack on a train from Brussels to Paris. Uh, that was quite a riveting tale, which some of you may recognize was turned into a movie by Clint Eastwood and Warner Brothers. Uh, the Mercenary, uh, which is presented as a, as a sort of a dual memoir, first from Jeff's perspective and then from Amal's, is uh, a more ambitious uh, book than Jeff's uh, previous two, uh, but it works, not just on the personal level of portraying an enduring friendship, but also on the larger level of depicting the human costs of war. Uh, Jeff will be in conversation this evening with broadcast journalist Mike Walter, uh, who's uh, the general news anchor on CGTN America, where he also hosts the talk show Full Frame. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jeff Stern and Mike Walter. All right, I think you're over here, Jeff. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, quick disclaimer, um, I'm a good friend of Jeff Stern's. I'm also a big fan of Jeff Stern's. I've read all of his books. And uh, this one is my favorite, by the way, and I'm sure if you have a chance to read it, you'll feel much the same way. Just as uh, kind of a background on how Jeff and I came to know one another, um, I think there's, there's similarities between Jeff and Amal and myself in that we've all had to hustle at points in our life. And I think that's what's one of the great things about this book is just all the hustling that's going on, not just on your part, but his as well. Um, I had left uh, WSA, the CBS affiliate, and started out kind of freelancing and trying to get work and all that sort of thing. And I get a call from a friend of mine. He's like, hey, I want you to host this show. And um, it's called Parkinson's in the, in the Crossfire. And you're just gonna be doing this thing with all these doctors and stuff. And so I get to know the doctors, and one of the doctors talks to me about his son, and he'd really like me to meet his son, because his son is certifiable, basically. <laughs> and, um, and so basically, he sees like there's different silos for journalists. And I'm kind of the Ozzy and Harriet version. You know, I put a suit on, and I go to work each day, and that's kind of the silo he'd like to see his son in. His son, on the other hand, is going off to Afghanistan and then tracing Ebola, and he'd just as soon have him move into my silo. 
Um, you can tell I haven't done a very good job of, of moving him into my silo, uh, but Matt's here tonight, and uh, we've had a long friendship, and and uh, and it was great because he introduced me to Jeff, and, and I've watched Jeff as he's kind of uh, traversed around the world doing all these amazing things. One of the things, though, when you read this book, and when, when Matt first told me about his son going off and covering Afghanistan, I immediately thought, okay, well, this is a journalist going off to cover Afghanistan, and, you know, I have friends who've done that, and they go through this, you know, training where they kind of uh, prepare for hostile work environments, and then they have drivers, and they have security. Jeff didn't have any of that. I mean, he went over, he was incredibly naive, and so I will ask you, the first question I'm going to ask you is the question I'm sure your father asked, just four words, what were you thinking? Because it's truly insane. If you read this book, you're going to be like, oh, my God, what was this guy thinking? What were you thinking? I wasn't, I think. Is the, <laughs> I think it started as, it actually started literally as a joke. I was interning at CNN Presents, and it was sort of this open joke that I was the least qualified intern they'd ever had. And at some point, uh, one of the producers said, oh, my friend is the bureau chief in Islamabad or Kabul for the Washington Post or something, he's, and he's leaving. And I said, I'll take over. Like, as, it was sort of this obvious joke, and everyone had this big guffaw. And then it was like, remember when Jeff said he would? And then at some point, it was like, no, wait a minute. Uh, at the time, I was about to graduate with really no job prospects, and I wanted to write, but I had no real portfolio. So this like joke became kind of this fantasy, and then turned into like maybe a bit of an idea, and then, and then I had this opportunity to meet the president of the university, and I must have told him this because at the commencement address, he said, and this person's going off to teach with Teach for America, and this person's going to cure AIDS. And this person is going to go be an investigative journalist in, Afga in Afghanistan. And I, and I was like, is someone else doing that? <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, now I kind of have to. So he sort of like called me out. I, I want to say, you didn't have to. Um, but you did. Right, well. Um, and it's made for a couple of great books, by the way. Um, one of the things that I, I find, well, I, we talked about this earlier. I interviewed him for the show I do, Full Frame, earlier today. So this is going to be like Groundhog Day we're for gonna, him. We're he's going to talk about that. He's, 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 he's going to answer a lot of the same questions. But one of the questions I asked, what, basically one of the compliments I laid on him was how much I love the structure of this book. Because it, first of all, it starts off with this scene where you're just like you're hooked. And then it tells the story about Young Jeff kind of growing up, going off to university, and then going off to Afghanistan. And then we get to see them all growing up, and then them kind of intersecting. And what's great about it is his perspective is so different from Amal's. And I think it really kind of gives a lot of insight into the fact that, you know, as Westerners, we go over and we have kind of one perception, and the people that live there have a different perception. There's a much larger story than just your story and his story. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that I've, so I would really like to take credit for having come up with that concept, but I think my idea originally was, I'll do this book that makes me seem really cool and brave. <laughs> <laughs> and at some point, uh, the editor, Ben Adams, who's a book editor who I've worked with before, said, I think there's something else here. You know, this might be a chance to kind of peek back at you know, behind the window a little bit about of of what being a work correspondent is like, and and not just sort of, you know, the glamour and the whatever glamour is probably not the right word, but not just the you know, the, but the the motives, the sometimes self serving motives that even a journalist has, and it sort of occurred to us at the same time that it's one of those it like can be one of those professions where people are like. I guess the last president I was standing, people were like, this is a noble pursuit, and this is, you know, God's work. And so it was sort of a, what unfolded was this idea of, like, let's, pr let's present being a foreign correspondent with all of its, you know, kind of parochial motivations and, and pure motives and self-serving motives and, and see what, what you got wrong. And that kind of unfolded this idea of, like, telling my story and then telling, telling the story from another perspective and trying to show, and sometimes comical, hopefully, and sometimes, you know, traumatic ways, all the things that I, that I got wrong, that I didn't know, that I, times I was, thought I was helping people and wasn't, and sometimes was hurting people. 
One of the uh, passages in the book that I really like is uh, Amal goes to pick up some folks and he can't find the folks, but he finds this white guy. That's good enough, right? I'll pick him up. And that's how this relationship starts. It's really happenstance. Can you describe what that was like? Because for most of us, that would be a harrowing event. And here's this guy who kind of plucked you from the chaos and in many ways saved your life on more than one occasion. Yeah. Uh, on that occasion, I had no idea what was happening. I don't know even how I ended up there. But he, he saw this person... And the way he describes it is, was like, I saw this guy who was like white, but like not white, white. Yeah, he was like, and he, he describes it as being sort of, he looked like a little bit homeless and lost. And in his mind, I mean, he thought he really kind of knew foreigners because he'd, you know, he'd watched the Van Damme movies and Schwarzenegger movies. And I, and it, so his reaction when he first saw me was, was just like disappointment. <laughs> just sort of what dating is like. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so, so for me, I'm, you know, here's this guy who's charming and he's witty and, and for him, it's like, man, this is the American I get. <laughs> and then I, and then I kept asking him questions and I kept asking him questions and my dad is here somewhere and knows what, <laughs> what road trips with when I was really young and would just ask incessant questions. And so that's something that I think Amal and, and my dad have in common is, is patience with, with a, like a disappointing American such as myself. <laughs> the other thing about him is his job he was not supposed to give out his phone number uh that was like a given you you work as a driver and people call you know the dispatch and then you're dispatched but uh he made an exception in your case he gave me his phone number yeah <laughs> there's another dating joke to be made here <laughs> um yeah he I, he did not not out of any i think he was just the way he described it he was just worried about me he didn't really know me yet. He just sort of felt this, he has this sort of protective instinct and saw this person who just had no idea what, what, I, what they were doing, he was doing, what I was doing, um, and, and decided, like, I'm going to break the rules. And not only, and he, he took it upon himself not only to protect me, but also, you know, I had, he picked up this, that I had this sort of fantasy of being a journalist. He knew other journalists. They all had connections. They all knew what they were doing. And he sort of realized, if this guy's going to make it, like, I'm going to have to do it myself. And so the other thing is, uh, journalists in far off lands like this have producers and people that work with them who make phone calls and set things up. He became that person in a way, didn't he? Yeah, he, he was like an entire bureau. He was a translator and a driver and security and everything all in one. You were able to sell stories and, and you were constantly hustling um, and he was feeding you stuff. But one of the things, and maybe you can talk about this, uh, there was one event that you covered where it got really dicey, and he was kind of your protector as well, where he plucked you out and said, maybe we can go to the morgue. He always knew how to advance the story, too. Yeah. He almost had kind of a journalistic sensibility. Talk to us about that, that episode. So that was one of the episodes that you narrate from both perspectives, because at the time, so we're covering a especially kind of grisly thing, um, and we had a kind of miscommunication, uh, and, and I thought he had sort of invented this idea of let's, let's go to the morgue. You, this is a, it was a, it was a minis it was a, uh, Afghan national army bus, a ministry of interior bus that was bombed. And so he said, let's go to the Afghan national army morgue. Uh, and I don't know where he had this idea, where it came from, but I, I so sure I sort of followed him. I, he seemed to know what he was doing. Um, and we ended up at the hospital and then in the, in the morgue, and it was, I mean, it was like obviously very grisly. Um, and I remember thinking, this is horrible, but thank God, you know, Amal is sort of hardened to this. He sees this all the time. This isn't affecting him. Um, you know, but wow, aren't I brave? Like I, I, you know, I saw this, and I recorded it for posterity or whatever. Um, and when, when I, when... I went back to talk to Amal to sort of tell that story from his perspective. It was obviously there were some very key differences. One was the entire reason he wanted to go to the hospital was because I kept asking for the number of dead. And uh, because editors kept asking me, and you could never find out, but editors would always say, we need a number, we need a number. So Amal was thinking, Jeff's going to ask me for a number, but where else to find number of dead than a, than a this was getting very grisly very quickly, than the, than the Ministry of Interior Hospital. Um, and, and, but the other thing that d didn't occur to me at the time, was, so first of all, it was Ramadan. He was fasting. It was really hot out. So he was like sick. And second of all, 
it was almost the opposite of the case. It was not that he sees this all the time, therefore it's not that hard for him. It was almost the opposite. It was it sort of invoked all the things that he that he'd witnessed, and he's and that's something that stayed with him, um, and he has nightmares about that. And that was the thing where I, you know, I was like, Psh, he's fine. You know, what about me? You uh, talk about your childhood growing up and you talk about his childhood growing up. And I think it's great because juxtaposing the two stories, you have this episode in the book where you're on a bus and you're bullied. And I think people in a Western audience can really identify with, you know, geez, this is tough. But then you tell his bus story as a child, which is entirely different. He's watching a girl get on a bus. You know, he's smiling at her. I think he winks. Boom, she's shot and killed. The difference is so stark his environment, your environment, and yet we still have this connective tissue, this bus story that you tell, which I think was such a great device to kind of show these two different worlds. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's really no question. It's just a yeah. compliment. Do you There'll have be many more coming. <laughs> yeah. Can you ask more questions like that, please? <laughs> no, but talk yeah. about it. I mean, it, it, because it's yeah. a device you used more than once. Yeah, so that I, I'm glad you brought that up, obviously, but also because... One of the things I worry about is, you know, can is it is it clear to a reader that this is one perspective and the other perspective? And this is a this is a moment in part two, a moment in Amal's perspective where it comes back to my perspective, and I worry that it's like confusing and people are going to get lost. But the entire reason for doing that was to sort of show that I'm in this entirely different universe, and yet there's these sort of parallels. There's these things that are. Um, so I tell the story of going out to Montana. My dad had a sabbatical, and we lived in Livingston, Montana for six months. And in the backyard, there's this giant satellite dish. We didn't really know how to use or really what it was doing. It, uh, and at the, at, that's in between where we learn about Amal being sort of obsessed with this little satellite dish that his brother's able to get. And he sort of uses it every once in a while to be able to learn about foreign people. And that's sort of where the obsession grows for him. So the, to me, it was sort of a way to try to show that these, you know, this sort of, like faded to intersect and these these sort of similarities and where we come from and also of course really stark differences um the bus being one but it, it's it's not meant to be uh it, it's i guess it's not meant to be too on the nose as we say right sort of like draw your own conclusion you know amal uh has a story that he goes on with you where he's kind of like this is just such a stupid story. This is a candidate who has no chance of winning the presidency. And you sold people on, we got to go do the story on this candidate who's, and you know he's not going to win the presidency, but it's a great story. Yeah. And yet, the name of the candidate, we all know in this room. Tell us that story. So this was, so this was uh, when was it, about 2008, 2009. So there's a few things happening that I was not aware of at the time. First of all, I, didn't, I had really had no sense uh, of, of the ethnic differences or tensions or uh and so i was take i wanted to do the story about this american afghan born but american um naturalized politician columbia university professor worked at the world bank um and it was sort of this novelty act uh but you know it was sort of an easy pitch and some publication was like yeah cool let's see this guy who is a professor but is like wearing a turban and yelling at campaign rallies um but it was it was down in like a very heavily Pashtun area where there's a lot of nationalism, where uh, Amal is, is from a different background, and he was sort of surrounded by a lot of people he felt differently from. Also, he was in the midst of these massive arms deals that I had no idea about that he left in order to take me down his dumb little story for this guy who could never win. And then I, five years was uh, yeah, five years later was it five years later? Five years we'll later? go with five. five years, he <laughs> There's won. no fact checkers here. You you have one for the book, but it's okay. And then he, that, so that, that was Ashraf Ghani, and then he ended up winning the presidency at some point <laughs> in the future. But at the time, it was just like and, yeah. Uh, but so prescient to know that this guy is going to be like a huge leader down the road of peace. I mean, you were so brilliant back then. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I love about this book too is that um, you know. I said this earlier, he's your driver, he's kind of your assignment editor, your producer, but he's also this hustler. Um, and what makes this story so rich is just, this guy's so amazing, he becomes a millionaire in Afghanistan, and then goes to Canada where he's homeless, and then becomes a millionaire again. Uh, I don't know of many stories like that. 
yeah, I don't, I guess I don't either. I, he has this sort of innate hustle um, and a kind of a kind of brilliance. And, I, and what I think of as almost like an x-ray vision is sort of like seeing the space, seeing the, I mean, the way he was able to um, exploit the situation in Afghanistan was that he basically worked in the breach in understanding. So, so there were foreigners who were there, like me, who thought they knew what they were doing and didn't. Um, and then there was there was there was value to be so so one of the ways he made a lot of money was taking armor that was provided a sort of patronage relationship to some of the warlords and politicians, but they were just sitting there that people had in their garage and saying, "I can lease this to the Americans who have no idea how much things are worth, and whatever it is, it's cheaper than ship you know than putting them on a C-130 and shipping them over." So he started charging thirteen thousand dollars a month for these uh, up armored SUVs. And then there'd be an attack somewhere, and he'd do fifteen thousand dollars. And it, and then he ran out, but he didn't want to tell people who didn't have them, so he'd just make up a number and say forty-five thousand dollars a month. People would say, "Sure, where do I sign?" And so he would scramble to find them. So he, had, you know, he would make millions of dollars with the stroke of a pen, because there was this sort of breakdown in understanding between, you know, in this sort of breach between, between the people traveling there and the people there. Cabo capitalism, though, is uh, pretty interesting because at one point, uh, as you said, somebody calls and says, I need him, 45000 They say, okay, I'll sign, and then he's got to find them. And then it just so happened somebody was going on vacation or something, and they had a bunch, and yeah. then he said, oh, I'll, I'll do oil changes. I'll take care of them. And yeah. basically rented them out to somebody else, yeah. right? I yeah, mean, he rented them twice. <laughs> he said <laughs> He said, oh, you're going out of town? We're going to do a special oil change treatment just, just for our finest customers to let us take the vehicles back. And he took them and leased them out again. So he's making money twice on the same vehicles. One of the things I really love about this book is there's a couple of words I'll use. Um, one is trauma. Uh, it's laced throughout the book. And you mention it, but it seems as though you don't have time to actually deal with the trauma that you're dealing with. And I think he doesn't either. I think the morgue is one of those episodes where he goes out and he throws up, and it's, you know, as, as I think you rightly point out as a journalist, these are people who died in a, in a war. These are his neighbors. These are people he lives with. Um, talk to me about how you go about compartmentalizing the trauma, how he went about it, and what the harm is of that. Yeah. I think I think I think for me, I didn't realize that I didn't actually have to because, as you say, I, as awful as things were or felt, it it wasn't my home. And I've talked about this with a few of you. Like it, it, at times, it like felt like home. You know, I've now I have people that I love in this place, but it but I always at least know that I got another one. I can I can leave. I can come back. Um, and I think that's sort of a key difference. I think it's maybe roughly equivalent to the trauma surgeon who can go in and see grisly things and perform surgery and the blood is no problem, but then if someone rolls an ankle in the street, they're the first person who's sort of puking. I don't know if that's what trauma surgeons are like. I just <laughs> might have made that up. Your dad will do fact checking <laughs> on that later. <laughs> I think he knows some. <laughs> So, you know, there's sort of the clinical thing where it's here and it's work and I can prepare myself. Um, and that's something that's not available if it's in, if it's in your living room, you know, literally or, or sort of or in your home. Or, um, and I, and I, for me, the, when that ended really was, the, was with the collapse of Kabul where then all of the trauma was just on my phone, you know, and this is for a lot of people and in some cases, in some, uh, for many of you, way more than me. It, it, there's no escaping. There's no, oh, I can leave at the end of this. It's just constant. And um, one of the wonderful things about Afghanistan is it's very connected and people are, are, are really eager to learn. And I also really hate that because they can, <laughs> there's Facebook message and WhatsApp messages and Instagram message. And so it's sort of constant. And I sort of realized there's now there's no escape. There's no, you know, if the phone's on, then, um, then I'm, I'm seeing all the people that I'm, that I'm not helping. Um, and I guess in some way, I'm going to pretend like this was always the idea, but in some way that sort of brings me a little bit closer to him because some of the things we were doing together, um, it, it, I was able to leave. It was not my people, and it was his. So he, you know, so I got to experience what it was like to not be able to leave. You were always there for him uh, when it came to romance, too. I mean, there's a great story where you go off with him. He's courting this woman, and, and then that ends up in, as a misadventure. And, and that's another great entry point 
into how you saw it and how he saw it. I mean, he somehow you end up in the police joint and the cops yeah. are at, and you're doing this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm the American savior, yeah. and he's doing this to your knee and just yeah. squeezing as hard as possible. Yeah. And you're like, oh, he's telling me I'm doing a great job. <laughs> and then we get yeah. to see his perspective, which is just please shut up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us that story. Yeah, so this is it started in a way that I, I we have different versions of it, and his and his version, by the way, is the true version because, if for no other reason than he speaks the language and I and I, pretend that I do, <laughs> uh, but he, you know, he, he, his father had died really young, so it was really important to find a wife. He had no one to help him, so he was constantly, you know, he was constantly hustling there too, and he met this young woman who worked at one of the um, at the worked at the Turquoise Mountain Foundation. Some of you, um, and. And they sort of started this flirtation, and he wanted to show her. She was Afghan, but Afghan Dutch. She was the first time back in her country at the age of 25 or something like that. So he wanted to show her some of the really pretty parts of, of his country. And um, so he planned this picnic to the Salang Pass, which is like an hour or two from Kabul. It's this beautiful kind of like uh, waterfalls and rivers and high mountains and... Um, and he invited me, and my understanding was that I was going as kind of a character witness. I which, which like looking back, I don't know why I th thought that. He never said that. Uh, I just sort of assumed that I was of value. <laughs> um, and we end up, we we do this sort of picnic, and um, long story, slightly less long. We get in a little bit of trouble. People see us. She's she's an unrelated woman. Um, that's sort of offensive to some of the the. Um, police, the kind of unbadged police that are there. And we get kind of hauled in to this sort of police station and grilled. And I, for some reason, start to feel really wronged. Like I'm personally, you know, being offended here. And so I do the, you know, do you know who I am? That whole thing. <laughs> um, and they start to back down. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm going to, and I pull out my passport. Why that I thought was a good idea, I, do, I don't know. Um, and Amal starts touching my knee, and so I'm like, oh, yeah, he's encouraging me, and, you know, eventually we get out of there, and I'm like, you're welcome, guys. No problem, <laughs> anytime. American savior. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, of course, it turns out that was almost exactly the opposite of what happened. I, I was, I, they were getting really angry at me because I was, like, being objectively obnoxious, and, and Amal was trying to kind of stage manage this thing where he, where he was sort of translating, he was n not translating what I was saying, he was translating what he what he what he wanted me to have said, and then he was trying to tell Fatima was the name of the girl, tr trying to tell her what to say, when to speak Farsi, and when not to, when to present like a foreigner, when to present like an Afghan. He was trying to so he sort of stage managed this whole thing, and somehow, not because of me, but like very much, uh, in spite of me, was able to get us out safely. Um, b but it was <laughs> but it was a lot harder because I wouldn't shut the fuck up basically. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's really a great passage. Um, I mentioned this to you earlier today, uh, reading this book, I kind of felt like if this guy grew up in the United States, he'd be Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Uh, if he grew up in China, he'd be Jack Ma. Um, uh -huh. But instead, he grew up in Afghanistan. But he still became a millionaire. And when you become a millionaire there, you're kind of a marked man. I mean, people take notice, and suddenly the Taliban have an interest in him. And so he has to figure out some way to escape and get out of the country. Talk to us about that, because that was really harrowing. And and again, he's just so smart in how he kind of works his way out of that whole event as well. Yeah, this was sort of an example of he was sort of a victim of his own success. He'd figured out how to, he'd figured out how to endear himself to all the Western security contractors and the ISAF people and the NATO people. And so one of the comparative advantages he was able to give his clients was that, was that uh, he, he could kind of skip the searches. And what he realized is that, is that the foreigners, the Western people, really didn't like Afghans having any power over them. So Americans, foreigners, didn't like sitting in, at checkpoints. It, it sort of felt offensive to them or whatever. So they all figured out how to, who to bribe, who to give you know, the whiskey to, to, to be able to get past the checkpoints without extra searches. And people loved him for it. And then as a result, it was one of the things the Taliban took notice of because he was able to get onto bases without as much searching. So this was a, at the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, and they were planning this sort of Trojan horse-style attack where they were going to use his company to get onto these bases. And he kept thinking he could kind of hold them off and, and talk his way out of it, and eventually became clear that he just was not going to be able to. Um, and so 
that plus he had sort of cheated one of his business partners who was kind of coming for him it just became clear he had he there he had no he had he had nowhere to go but to leave the country and so he paid a smuggler and that becomes you know chapter 14 of part two <laughs> <laughs> which is quite a read um so we know that he's a driver and we know that he's a translator and we know that he's kind of your producer but one of the things we don't know at this point until we get to page 285 i believe it is um, he's also uh, your philosopher. He, he, you're really struggling uh, because you've tr you're trying to get people out of Afghanistan, and as you can imagine, it's incredibly complicated. And this pressure of knowing these people, they're not like faces on the news. These are people you know, and you know they're in danger, and you want them out of the country. And he says this to me, to you, and I, and I just loved it. Um, he said, uh, P please be realistic about what you can achieve. You are Jaff. He always calls you Jeff. I'm Amal. We are not Jesus or Muhammad, um, which I thought was just like okay, that's pretty, that'll calm you down. It'll also yeah. provide a smile or two. Yeah. Talk to me about his uh, philosophical lines because they're sprinkled throughout, and he just he just has these great lines. Yeah, I always thought it must be really frustrating for him because he is really philosophical, and he will say things all the time that that. Well, a lot of the time he says something just makes no sense because I can't understand it. But every once in a while he says something. Oh yeah. I always think it must be really frustrating for him because he's he's such a like gifted linguist. He's you know the gift of gab, but he's um, but he comes up with stuff so fast, and yet he, you know he never no one ever taught him English. He learned English from from hiding out and watching the satellite dish. So I always think like, man, if he if he if he if I could actually hear him in his native language. And I guess it didn't occur to me that I could just learn his language. But <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot more work, isn't it? Yeah. Um, here's another one from him, uh, and I just love this one, uh, where he talks about his purpose on Earth. I'm here to be nice, smile, and laugh, and leave. I mean, what a great way to s summarize somebody living a great life. Yeah, and the other thing I'm just thinking now is, I think all of us have little sayings we say that sound really cool, that we sort of try not to repeat to the same people, but say all the time to make ourselves sound. Everything he says is sort of like spur of the moment he's just thought of. Um, so these are all like, they're all really genuine. They're not, they're not canned, you know. And as a friend, he really is that to you, isn't he? Yeah. He's that guy that brings a smile. And um, you write this, and I want to kind of probe this just a bit. You say writers who go to war zones tend not to be supportive of war, though we might be accused of having a kind of chemical dependence on it, a hatred and a need for it. Um, can you describe what that need is for you? Because I know your dad wants to know what it is, and he wants to do a lobotomy and remove it. Because I mean, he's talked to me about, oh my God, he's doing this now, and and I think the rest of the family probably feels much the same way. And we know we have a lot of family contingent here, so I'm asking that on behalf of them. I think it's really important for writers to give their parents things to bitch to their <laughs> friends about. <laughs> At the end. Um, I don't, so I, I, one of the things I think is, you know, it's, is it's, in some ways it's, so we talked about this earlier, full disclosure, but in some ways I think it's easier, easier to write about conflict that's just conflict. You know, it's, it's a little bit harder when it, you know, interpersonal, con familial conflict. Um, you know, there's, one of the things I talk about in that scene, the bullying scene, is that it was actually kind of exhilarating, because it's, it's out there and it's real and it's not, you know, passive aggressive, what, you know, the, so I think there's a, and then also there's a, it becomes e when things are really dark, it becomes easy. This is super cliche, but when things are really dark, it becomes easier to see things that are light. And so the, the kind of hopeful, you know, rewarding, romantic, whatever stories to me are like, they're kind of become more accessible um, when, when they're not, when they're in a place where, that people don't think of as 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 having those kinds of stories. Uh, I was in Somalia in the early '90s, and um, I, I know we don't have a lot of war correspondents or people who are in war zones, but uh, so I can feel like I can talk a little bit about this with you. Uh, clearly, not the same as what you went through, but um, you see people on technicals, and they're chewing cat, and they're crazy, and there's guns everywhere, and everything's demolished, and you're sitting there saying to yourself. What am I doing here? But everybody you talk to, when you talk to them, you, you don't get somebody looking back at you, you get them doing this. And you don't know what they're looking for, or but they're like hyper vigilant. 
Describe what it's like to be in a war zone and how does it change your psyche and how you go about your daily life? That's one thing that just made me think of is, so Muhammad is here somewhere, oh, right there. Uh, hey. Uh, Muhammad is an old friend of mine uh, from Herat, from Western Afghanistan, who's here just to film me. <laughs> Uh, but um, we had this conversation years ago where he was talking about how people were beginning to pay attention to, um, or I don't know, he'd write an article or something about, uh, about kids in Syria and how difficult it is to sort of grow up in the middle of conflict. And, and I'm bastardizing what he said, and he's right there, so he could just correct, <laughs> correct me. But, I may just interview him. I may just interview him. Right. He's way more interesting. Uh, but... You know his his contemporaries. It's been years and years of this. So what is that? You know what is that? And and people like Muhammad and also Bakhtash is right here, sort of making art and telling stories that are sort of a different, you know, a, a different look at a place that we often think of as a sort of very simple violence and war. What's next? Um, that wasn't the question you asked. I just wanted to make Muhammad feel uncomfortable because he's <laughs> hiding behind a camera. Uh, but I do, th I do think there's a sense of sort of like constant vigilance that if you're, and I think this is probably anywhere where you're a little bit uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be a war zone. If you're in a neighborhood you don't go too often. If you're, you know, in the, whatever, that there's a sense of am I being watched? And, and that can, that, that sort of hypervigilance eventually becomes, can become the source of disease. Um, and I think finally we're beginning to, to have an awareness, an understanding of PTSD and, um, but I think that we're still sort of just scratching the surface. I think we still sort of are like, this person experienced a giant explosion, maybe they're traumatized, rather than this person spent their entire childhood looking over their shoulder. What does that do? You know, I was just, uh, it's because I just finished your book, uh, it made me think about the Nashville shooting because, um, you know, that uh, I'm sure you probably saw this, a woman came up and kind of, took the mics away and said, you know, I survived a, a mass shooting in Illinois. I'm on vacation here in Tennessee. You know, this is insane. When's this going to stop? One of the correspondents uh, for one of the Nashville stations was on live saying, you know, uh, this is bringing back a lot of bad memories. I survived a school shooting in Alabama. And, uh, you know, this is bringing back a lot of thoughts. And I started to think about, you know, uh, we're obviously quite different here in the United States. We're not in a war zone. But there were kids who were growing up here in the United I mean, it, this probably isn't in your wheelhouse, but it just got me thinking because I had read your book and especially Amal seeing, you know, kids shot and killed on a school bus, and yet it's actually happening here in the United States too. Does it make you think? I mean, what are your thoughts? And I don't want to get you like real controversial, but it did make me think. Oof. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that's another question where I, I can't, there's nothing but sort of to agree, like, you know, you don't, you don't have to be in the middle of a civil war to, to have horrible things happen. Um, I, I don't really have a smart <laughs> response other than... Okay, I'll move on. I don't want to <laughs> put you on the spot. I just, I just started thinking about that. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to read a passage from the book, which I typed out here. Much I prefer that. I could have read it from the book, but I'm not going to do that. Um, because... Uh, you know, when you see the book title, and it's The Mercenary, and I love the book cover, you think, oh, well, this is a story about a mercenary uh, in Afghanistan. But then, you know, as we get later into the book, you write this. I'd gone as a journalist, not a soldier, not a gun for hire, certain that this meant my hands were clean. I hadn't fired a weapon there. So how could I injure people? Well, I'd injured people. I'd written a book exposing the inner thoughts of people from a traumatized community, of a 13-year-old girl who'd watched bombs kill classmates, I'd made her recount the moments, then made her recount them again so I could get the details just right, and then showed her to the world as if I was saving her. Um, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because there's a lot of introspection in here about journalism and what we do as journalists. And I think, you know, you had mentioned glamour earlier, and we'll, we'll push that to the side, but just importance. You know, we, we go off, we're important, we're landing there, we're telling these stories, we're the eyes and the ears. We don't think about doing damage as journalists. And you, you kind of address that in here, and it makes people think. I mean, what were your thoughts as you were writing this and kind of exploring that? So th I mean, this might be a way I can sort of half answer the last question, because I'm now remembering uh, that around the time I was graduating college, there was some um, 
panel discussion, and there was this woman who covered. Um, I remember yes, yes, yeah. I remember this part. Oh, you were yeah. teeing this up, and I missed it. Uh, <laughs> she had been covering this shooting at uh, Amish uh, school, and I remember this thing she said, where it's like it's horrible, and you just want to leave these people alone, but you can't, or you know, but you have a job to do, or something like that. I remember thinking, you can't, like, but why not? And then I went to Afghanistan, traumatized a bunch of people. But <laughs> I, you know, the the that stuck in my head is. Uh, as sort of this question of you know we and we kind of license ourselves to 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 do whatever to you know I'm going to interview this person and it might traumatize her and she might be uncomfortable whatever like I'm spreading the word or something and it's not to cast aspersions on all of journalism of course um, but I, but I do think that I at least I speak for myself like I am guilty of saying be, because I am trying to share this thing with these people you know because I'm trying to correspond. Uh, any, any that licenses me to do anything, and and one of the things that I'm trying to grapple with is, is when it does and when it doesn't, and also who, kind of who am I to decide. The end of the book is basically a race against the clock to try and get people out of Afghanistan. And uh, for those who read your earlier book about Marafat, we know what an important school that was, and and really it's it stood as kind of the symbol of what America was there for in many respects, you know, to elevate these young women. And, and you and I actually did another full frame where, where I interviewed one of the students uh, from Marafat who was right. now in the United States. I think she was studying at George Washington, is that right? That's right, right yeah. Um, amazing story. Um, and yet here you are racing against the clock to get these people out. And again, this is, is kind of like the Nashville question. It's an unfair mm -hmm. question. but. What can we learn from Afghanistan? And I mean, and how tragic is it to, to be over there covering it and then suddenly, oh my God, these aren't stories. These are people and I know these people and I gotta do everything I can to get them out. And then to see how you know, difficult it is, the landscape to actually pull that off. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I think of um, this moment where, uh, Michael Matrinko, who was a friend and um, one of the first sort of very quiet supporters of um, of that school, uh, and and helped and helped in huge ways, but was uh, was with Aziz, who was the founder, was sort of a little, always a little bit snarky and, and would say, well, "I'm not going to help you," and no one from the U.S. is going to help you, and and his reasoning was because we're not going to be here forever, and that was both obviously true and also just sort of radical departure from all of the evidence at the time. I mean, from 2002 to 2011 or 12, just building and building, and the U.S. Embassy got bigger and bigger and bigger, and you kind of know that that we, no country stays in another country forever, but it also is just contrary to all the physical evidence around you. And so I think about that moment a lot. I was not there for it, but that, that I think both of them told me about. Um, and kind of the foresight, and then in a way the humility that that Michael Matrinko had um, is in some ways kind of a model. So, so if there's a lesson, and I don't think I'm in any position to say we should do this and not do that, and I'm an expert on this or not that. Um, I mean, I'm not an expert on anything. <laughs> but I think one thing is, and and this is I think a theme that I'm trying to, you know for some people is the humility that people like me and lacked, right? And so I, I don't, the, the line I say, the sort of line that sounds good in my head, so I repeat it sometimes, is it wasn't, it wasn't destined to end the way it did, but that when it started the way it did, then it kind of was destined to end in tragedy one way or another. You mentioned humility. Let's talk about another H word, which is honesty, which is another thing that really comes through in this book. Uh, you know, he is very honest about his life and his, you know, sh shortcomings and some of the things he did that he clearly felt were not great. Um, you're also very honest about your life. You're you're honest about kind of a difficult relationship you ha had with your mom, about, uh, you know, going and seeing your sister and trying to, you know, and, and I kind of just want to talk to you about that because I think a lot of people when they're writing this, like, well, I'll leave that part out because that's me. Yeah. Um, how difficult is it for you to actually say, no, nope, I've got to, if he's going to be honest, I've got to be honest, I've got to put this in there? Yeah, I think that was it. I'd, I would have much preferred to 
continue to present myself as, a, you know, as a hero who always made the right decisions. But then he was, he wanted to be really honest and to sort of say, here's my rags to riches story, and then my other rags to riches story, and here's all the stuff that I, where I was just, you know, shitty, and I, and I hurt people, and here's what's going through, and here is the, imp, you know, the sort of compromise motives I had at this time. And this, this was sort of an opportunity in some ways to kind of put my, I guess not put my money, put my mouth where my, whatever, anyway, to sort of <laughs> do you in the You just said it like George W. Bush, keep going. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you fool me once. It was, it was an opportunity to kind of do what I'm preaching, you know, which is like, I'm, I'm going to this place and going to these people's lives, and in this case, this person is very close to me, and sort of taking everything, you know, and everything he's willing to share, and maybe some stuff even that he says he's comfortable sharing, but he's not really, but he's just trying to accommodate me. And I'm, and it's a little bit extractive, you know? It's, and so I'm doing that, like what choice do I have but to, but to try to kind of meet him where he is? I, I know we gotta open this up for questions and we got a, a microphone over here, but I do wanna ask one final question before we, and people just need to come up here if they wanna ask a question to Jeff. Um, I do have one final question, and I think I saw Jeff here earlier as one of your uh, classmates from Duke University, uh, and we've done lunch before, and oh, there he is over there. And the remarkable thing is, you went to Duke University. That's, and that's then, Jeff number two, by the that's way. That's Jeff number two, that, that, yeah, that's on record. I do know that. You can just call him number two, though. Um, you, <laughs> you went to Duke University, as did Jeff number two, and, um, and you, when, I mean, everything is chaos in Kabul. You're trying to save lives. You're trying to get people out of Afghanistan. And yet one of your classmates there at Duke uh, was Stephen Miller, kind of the architect of trying to cage children. So were you guys in the same classes and maybe you didn't get the messages you got or? Uh... Very close friends, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we were, I mean, that's another, that's just, what's the opposite that's of a, a softball? That's a hard, I don't know how to. Yes, we were even in the same dorm. Really? Yeah, we were basically roommates. It was my next door. Yeah, we called him Guns. I didn't realize why at the time. Now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Should have called him Cages, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, we do have this microphone over here. If anybody has a question or two for Jeff, I'm sure he'd love to field them. How do you like that? I covered everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why don't you come up here if you? I, I can start now. Okay. So, did you let Amal read the book before you published it? Okay, so I'll, yeah. I'll repeat the question in case people missed it. Did you let Amal read the book, and was he comfortable with what you wrote about him? Yeah, so I did, which was which is a little bit, you know, sort of ethically, you're trying to figure out. Normally, normally in fact checking, you sort of read the facts or the quotes or whatever, but you don't let someone read it because anytime you see yourself on, you know, you always want to change. I want to change it, and I wrote it. I'm like, I don't look good. I should change. So I, we did. I did, and there were some things we ch we had to change because they were just wrong. Um, there were a few things that you know he asked to to leave out, but for the most part, he wanted to be really candid. And actually, the part that he actually got upset with me about was the stuff about me. And my struggles that I hadn't, that he didn't know about, and he, so he was sort of like, "What am I here for if not to, you know, be, to be there for you?" Um, you said earlier that um, it didn't have to end in tragedy, except for the way it started. It had to end in tragedy, but was there another way it could have started so that it didn't end in tragedy? Yeah, I was hoping someone wouldn't <laughs> call me out on that. <laughs> I think I so I, th I think sort of the fact that I feel like we went in the way I went in, which was which was with a just sort of lack of humility. You know, it's that I keep c coming back to that word, but um, I I I I don't believe that it was just you know I hear oh the graveyard of empires and I, and everyone who goes in it and that never quite resonated. But the but the fact that what I experienced was. A lot of people who, like me, had you know read one book or maybe read in a book that had to do with Afghanistan said, "I get it. I'm you know I'm going to come here and teach people about democracy," um, without really any understanding of of the history of what was there of the 
Um, and I think, I think that kind of predestined it to, to one way or another, that sort of lack of understanding and lack of humility kind of, that did kind of, I think, if something doomed it, it may have been that. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> uh, hi, Jeff. Uh, I'd, just, I'd just like to set the record straight a little bit. Uh, I think you had said you were the most unqualified intern in the history of CNN. Well, it was through our family connections that I got you that internship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were not unqualified. You were already a star at, at oh. Duke University. But I just want to say, I, I do have a question, but just one little story to embarrass you because this is the right venue to do that. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, in interns, when they work uh, at media companies, are supposed to just absorb information, ask a few questions, and sort of stay in their lane. But <laughs> Jeff wasn't exactly like that. And uh, uh, we had a big screening for a show called uh, In the Footsteps of Bin Laden, which I don't know if that was your first introduction to Afghanistan, yeah. but, but it was a show that I, that I made. And, and anyway, uh, uh, we had this big screening, a lot of tension, a lot of big wigs in the room, and everyone's kind of shuffling out afterwards. And, and Jeff goes up to the um, executive uh, editor of the show and says, I have notes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that. Uh, well, I remember it so well because that became sort of a joke that's gone on for years. Every, every time, it's a great punchline, I have notes. Oh, boy. <laughs> anyway. See, that was my fear interviewing him, that he had yeah, <laughs> notes afterwards. You should have asked this. So, so my question is, uh, you know, they're not, I don't know if how many journalists are in, the, in this room, but, you know, that kind of curiosity and, and sort of not staying in your lane is, is something that makes for a good journalist. But where did that come from in your case? I don't know, maybe just from like not understanding almost anything. <laughs> I don't know, I'd, I don't know the answer to that. I'd be, I'd be curious to find out. <laughs> but just for, so Cliff was the producer and director and editor of, this do, of the documentary In the Footsteps of Bin Laden based on the Peter Bergen book. Uh, so when I said like maybe people who've read a book or read in a book, I actually hadn't done either of those things. I just sat behind Cliff while he was in the edit bay and like watched some people who were either from Afghanistan or had been there and was like, I get it. That's enough for me. I'm going. And obviously it wasn't. But thank you, Cliff. Well, glad, glad to be there for you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later. You know, one thing, uh, if, if there are more questions, happy to. Oh, go ahead. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Jeff, hi. It's good Bye to see you. Good to see you. Um, I would love for you to talk about. Um, the catalyst for you to write this book. I think the timing is really curious. Um, it takes place much earlier. And so could you talk about what the collapse did as a matter of um, how it kind of put you on this trajectory and what mm -hmm. surfaced as a result? Like, be yeah. specific if you, if you could. And then there's many people in this crowd that don't know Afghanistan. There are many people that do. And I would love for you to kind of share what is it that you hope people know about Afghanistan as somebody who spent so much intimate time with, with it? Uh, uh, think That's another hour, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the, so the timing was fairly mercenary. It was I had this friend. I wanted to tell the story. I brought, you know, I have 10 or 15 pages that I bring out of the drawer every couple of years. And when Afghanistan came back in the news in maybe the spring or early summer, before, before before it got bad, and while some of us could still have some denial that it wasn't going to get that bad, but mm -hmm. people were talking about it, I yeah. thought, oh, this will be a chance to sort of like talk to editors about it. Sure. The idea was always, this will I'll do this later. I got projects now. I, of course, I had no idea how, how the collapse was going to take over some of our lives. Yeah. Um, and you know, there was one modest offer, and it was like, and you have this has to come out soon. So everything else has, you know, has to wait. Um, so I started working on it at the same time that the collapse kind of took over a, a lot of our lives. Um, and the, of course the collapse of Afghanistan was not part of it at all. The pitch mm -hmm. was me and my friendship with this guy who turns out to be an arms dealer is that neat. And, um, and, but I, I, think I, I think I never actually knew how the book was going to end, which in some ways is good and in some ways is, is not great, depending on what medium you're in. Interesting. And at, a, at a, some point, uh, agent said, I think it ends with Amal in jail and you basically in like a mental jail. And that, and that ended up being, you know, part three. Uh, 
so the so the collapse of Afghanistan sort of worked its way into the into the book in a way that I didn't and that, that I didn't anticipate. That makes it sound like it's this sort of like glamorous process where the angel visits and is like, here's this beautiful. Of course, it wasn't like that, but. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I wasn't planning to write a book that had anything to do with the collapse of Afghanistan because I think I was still hoping that it wouldn't. Right. Um, right. And, and and then the second piece, if you could kind of talk about what you hope that uh, people, what, what you could share about Afghanistan in terms of what you've learned and maybe what she's taught you. Uh, you know, I was just I was just telling us was just oh, Muhammad moved. <laughs> I was just talking to Muhammad about. Man, he's so sneaky. <laughs> he's like the guy in Arrested Development. Um, uh, so I, there were a lot of people who were like Amal that I that I would come across. I kept, I, I, this may surprise you, but I kept getting in trouble and like getting confused and getting lost. Every time I was in the country, I would get lost somehow. Mm. Um, and there's always someone who would just cancel their day and be like, this person needs some help. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna help him get out of trouble or help him find his way home. And there was that kind of like, you know. And in some ways, you could say that's universal. There's, um, p you know, people like to help strangers. Some countries more than others, um, but I, there was I had so many experiences like that where just just like a best friend from one day of, you know, let, you got on the wrong rickshaw. Let me take you back to where are you going? You know and um, I think that's sort of where my, you know, love affair with this, with this, with the life that I sort of had there started was just there was all these sort of, let's like say, like random acts of kindness. They're just this sort of like, um, that's so contrary to, you know, the A block news hit, you know, here's the dude with the long beard and the Kalashnikov. And um, so yeah. I guess it's that. It was just sort of all the kindness, <laughs> you know, and, and Muntu. That's right. <laughs> and the dumplings. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, um, I'm going to have one final question, and then he'll sit up here, and he'll sign books for everybody here. Um, so buy as many as you can. Buy for your friends, for your family, even people you don't know. <laughs> there, I helped you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. OK, so uh, and the final question is this. Uh, Jolie Lee is the producer of our show. And so I read the book. She read the book. And she's like, oh, I've got all these great questions. I'm going to send them to you. She reads a lot quicker than I do, and I didn't look at them until today because I hadn't finished the book. I finished the book today. But after uh, the interview, and she never does this, she went up to Jeff and she said, oh my god, I love this book. Will you please sign it? Will you autograph the book for me? And then we usher Jeff downstairs, and he leaves, and we're going up on the elevator, and she goes, it's amazing. I see it as a Netflix six-part series, and it's just its unbelievable. It's so great. And it got me thinking, who do you want to play you when it does come out in Netflix? <laughs> hmm. One of the Hemsworths, I think. <laughs> does he have to shorten his hide at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a joke as well uh, when it comes to roofing in the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amol, is, Amol made a lot of money roofing and then said, you can't do it. You need to be at least six feet or something like that. <laughs> Amo and I are actually no longer friends after. Because <laughs> of the roofing incident. Of the roof. um, yeah. Please give him a huge round of applause. Amazing book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.